So you are Pushkarini Devi Dasi from Budapest, and you are a PhD candidate at the Bhaktivedanta Academy there? No, at the at Vishlavaran University. At a regular university? Yes. And you're doing a PhD uh, studying the inception of ISKCON in Europe with special emphasis on... On the temples. On the temples in England and France. Because yes, those are the only two temples that were established when Srila Prabhupada was present in Europe. The only two temples in Europe that were established when Srila Prabhupada was present that are still going on. Uh, uh, Four temples. There were four temples. Soho Temple. Yes, Soho. Yeah, the Berry Place became Soho. So it's more or less the same. And there's Bhaktivedanta Manor. And there is the Chateau in France, New Mayapur. And the Radha Parasishwar Temple, which has subsequently moved, but it's still going on. And the, the temples in Germany, which are present now, were not there at the time. And the ones that were there when when Srila Prabhupada was there, uh, uh, are, uh, then, the, the, the location is then in different locations. In Rome we had something also, when Srila Prabhupada was present, just, but just in a very primary stage. Yes. And in uh, Holland, in Amsterdam, we had something. But we don't have any Amsterdam now, do we? Just some preaching center or I'm something? I'm not sure. No, but there hasn't been, as far as I know, there hasn't been a continuous presence because... Uh, the, as far as I know, the Amsterdam temple is closed for quite some time. Okay, uh, and your subject is, you want to ask me a whole bunch of questions about what ISKCON was like then, more or less. And your personal... My personal take on it, yeah. Um, and about the temples. I was, I, I joined fairly late in, in the period that Srila Prabhupada was present in this world in 1975 and I left England with the intention of relocating to India, which I continued to do throughout most of this life, before Srila Prabhupada left. Just actually, just, uh, let me see, I left on August the 22nd, 1977, so that is just two and a half months, or two and a bit months before Srila Prabhupada left. So I, I wasn't in England very long in the early days. There are many others who could give you more, fill you in more. Uh, have you interviewed others? Presumably you've interviewed others. Uh, a few, yes. Yeah. Who have you interviewed? Uh, um, um, two brothers, Chatur Bucha Prabhu and Karanakur. Uh, right, although they weren't in the temples. Yes, but they were, uh, they, they into were the, in the, fir the first initiation. They were among the, the first initiation yes. in England, yeah. Uh, Ram Sharana Prabhu and uh, his wife. Oh, uh, is he Jana in England now? Yes, he just uh, happened that he, uh, he's here right now. Right, he's, he went to America. Yes. Ram Sharan Janaki, they came after me. But they, they were there. In the same year, I think. Yeah. 74, 75. No, they, came, they came in 75, but they, they came some time after me. Mm -hmm. But in this span of time, it doesn't look like very long. Yeah. Then? Uh, tomorrow I, I am going to meet with Partha Prabhu. Partha? Oh, yes. yeah. Please convey my heartfelt obeisance to him. <laughs> Is he in London? Yes. Oh, I should have met him. Anyway, who else is there? Uh, I'm going to meet, hopefully, with Kripa Moy Prabhu. Kripa Moy, yeah, he's a, yeah, he should be very helpful for you. I'm in touch with Ash Ashtasaki Mataji. Mm -hmm. um, is she in England? Yes, she's in England. Mm. Uh, Jagat Bandhu Prabhu. Jagat Bandhu? Yes. Oh, good. He's in a uh, bad health, unfortunately. Hmm? He's in a bad health, unfortunately. Bad health, yeah. Mm. Uh, and I wrote many other I disciples. Actually, next year there's, the, uh, there's going to be a big gathering, isn't there? Yes, in Bhaktivedanta Manor. That would be Tamar. the best time to meet. Then who else? Who have you met so far? Who have uh, you met? Just with them. 
Oh, you've interviewed all the names you've said so yes, far. Yes, just I'm here just uh, uh, for a few days. I see. Uh, Jai Lakshman? No. Rancho? I wrote to him and he hasn't answered yet. Hmm. Mahavishnu Maharaj? Mukunda Maharaj? Uh, Mukunda Maharaj, I'm a little bit afraid uh, to reach him. I would like to. Uh, I wrote to Mahavishnu Maharaj as well. Uh, and um, in August we will speak online with Keshav Bharati Maharaj, Janananda Maharaj. Mm. Mukunda Maharaj you should contact. Why? Why? <laughs> should be no fear of contacting mm. him. Mm. And um, Prabhu Vishnu Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu Vishnu Maharaj as well. And Bhagavatashna Prabhu, uh -huh. uh, Manjuali Mataji. Mm -hmm. So I have a list uh, I would like to Shamasundra. Do interview. Shamasundra Prabhu. Shamasundra yes. Malati. Malati Mataji. Yes. Okay, so what do you want to ask me? Firstly, I would like to introduce yourself. Uh, well, what do you want to know specifically? I, I was allowed to join this movement in 1975. I first visited Bhaktivedanta Manor, I believe it was on Easter Sunday in 1975. Uh, having gone there, I decided to, or I asked if I could stay, and they allowed me. Um, so right at that program? Right, uh, yeah, on the, the, the day I went there, I decided to join. Or I, I asked if I could join, and they were open to that. Um, but I, subsequently, I didn't join for maybe 10 days or two weeks after that, because I had some some things I had to look after, or something, there was something pending, which, in retrospect, I didn't need to, but I did. Oh, Radha Krishna? You going to contact him? He's no. Because uh, he came and picked me up with all my useless possessions. Uh, because my father's house wasn't far from the mountain. Hemel Hempstead? Mm -hmm. You don't know. Britain. I'm not really yeah, it's know. The, uh, I think it's if you go up the motorway, it's uh, two two exits from Watford. Hello, hello. I just went there last night to see my stepmother. It's just a short drive from the manor. Yeah. So. What was your uh, birth name? Can I ask you? Yeah, you can ask me. Hugh Turvey. That's it. You wouldn't be able to spell it because it's non-phonetic, the first name especially. Mm. Mm. Uh, how did you m meet Krishna Consciousness? How did I come in contact with Krishna Consciousness? It's, internally it's a long story, what was my internal uh, preparation or Krishna preparing me. But to put it simply, uh, I read Krishna book volume two, which was in the in the house where I was staying in Ireland. I realized there's something deep here. Uh, there was no center, there no devotees in Ireland at that time. There had been prior to that, but many regional centers were closed down when the manor opened because they needed many devotees. That's an important point for you if you didn't get it yet. That when the manor opened, there were, quite, there were already quite a few regional centers which were closed down, consisting of just a few devotees because they, they needed manpower for the manor. So there was no center in Ireland at the time. And... <clears throat> reading that book and then thinking I wanted to go and see. I, I wanted to see if they're actually living what they say. Mm -hmm. And if they were, I, I, I wanted to join. Mm. Maybe, it must have been about two years before that because the manor opened in 73 or maybe it was one year before that. I'd seen on TV, although generally I didn't watch TV, 
but I happened to be reading a book and the TV was on for some reason or other. And I just looked up, it, it just caught my interest where they interviewed a husband and wife at Bhaktivedanta Manor. I didn't really think much of it, but it stuck in my head that the somehow or other the name of the village, Lechmore Heath, stuck in my head. That it was at Lechmore Heath, and at the time I had no thought of joining or any, no such thought. But then it stuck in my head, and then uh, I went from Ireland back to my father's house, which was at Hemel Hempstead, near to, near to Watford. I looked it up in the AA map. I don't know if you know what that is. That before the before the present age, we for driving around Britain, we used to have maps. Especially the the AA map was very useful. So I found it, and then I went by bicycle because it was a short distance, about twelve miles, something like that. And then I stayed. That's it in brief. Could be expanded a lot more. Mm -hmm. So, you were convinced at the first contact? Well, I knew I had to do something with my life, and I, I wanted to find God, and I knew I wasn't going anywhere by myself, and I needed guidance. And, uh, and I knew also that if I get into something, I really have to get into it. There's no halfway, and I, I can't... I would be dishonest to myself and to God if I... If, having such an opportunity, I didn't take it. So I knew how to take it. But I also, yeah, there were three things I was looking for. I, I, had, I had to be vegetarian, had to believe in reincarnation, because it didn't make any sense to me that God just punishes you and sends you to hell forever. Reincarnation makes sense. And I had to be believing in God, because I wasn't interested in Buddhism or impersonalism or anything like that. I had, a, I had a healthy disgust for such things even before coming to the Lotus Feet of Srila Prabhupada, which was solidified by the teachings of Srila Prabhupada. Mm. As I know, you were, very, uh, you were quite young at that time. Yeah, but I was 18, but then everyone was young. Mm. It was a bit younger than most for joining. Most the devotees joined a little older, but not much older. And I was always, as I was growing up, I was always mentally or psychologically older than my age. If you get what I mean. I was, when I was 15, I was like 17, which makes a lot of difference in your teens. So, I was 18, but I, I wasn't a child. I'd already traveled by myself over much of Britain, which isn't a big thing, I guess, but I did. I, I knew how to look after myself in many ways. I wasn't a mother's boy. Because my mother... I think from the age of 14 or around maybe 13 or 14, she was in and out of mental hospital and then, and then she was in and not out. Mm. I see. Uh, what was the social judgment of the movement at that time when you joined? When I joined... You'll get different answers for that, but in general, uh, it was known to some extent, and it was considered strange, laughable, <laughs> not dangerous. That never happened as in America. It was never considered dangerous or seriously wrong, from what I can see. It was for the for the police in central London. It was almost like a sport for them to catch our devotees and arrest them. Yeah. 
on. I have heard about that. <laughs> and um, it was because the world was very different. The Western, the Western world was very different, and uh, nowadays you, could, no one looks twice when you're dressed like this. Last night I was visiting my my stepmother. And my father died just a few months ago, so I visited her. And uh, one of her grandsons came and she was going to get up and said, no, I'll answer the door because she's so old. And he said, oh, you're, you'll frighten him to death. I opened the door. He obviously he wasn't expecting at his grandmother's house to see someone dressed like this. Although he must, he, he must know that somewhere among his relations is, there, I, there's me. So I opened the door and he didn't bat an eyelid. He's about tw 21 years old, something like that. It, was, it just wasn't an issue. I could see. I, he wasn't surprised, nothing. I opened the door and said, I'm, I'm frightening you to death. I never seen him, never heard of him, but that that shows that uh, there's much greater level of acceptance, which wasn't there in the 1970s, and it was a regular thing that we'd get arrested, distributing books in different parts of the country, or if not actually get arrested, we would be uh, always on the lookout for the police, so we didn't get arrested, and some places were worse than others. So that was there, but the police were arresting us. I, I don't, they didn't say it. it wasn't like in America where you had all this anti brainwashing deprogramming that never happened. You must know that, that this uh, Ted Patrick, who was the great deprogrammer, he, ar he arrived in London to start his campaign and the uh, he was sent right back from the airport. They wouldn't allow him in the country, they didn't want him so. Uh, that in, intense rejection wasn't there. Yeah, some fanatical Christians, but in general it wasn't there. But it was considered laughable. Oh yeah, I'll tell you something. <laughs> Another experience I had of Hare Krishna, of course, the, before I joined, of course there was the uh, George Harrison's My Sweet Lord, and, and then the, the Hare Krishna was on there, but I wasn't much into pop music. At one point I was, but then I just got fed up of it all. I, I wasn't a great fan of the Beatles or any such thing, but... Uh, <laughs> one time I was at a football match, Watford. You don't know, because the man is near to Watford, so Watford has a crummy professional football team. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I'd get beaten up by the Watford fans. But uh, yeah, I was a Watford fan. So one time in the middle of a match, someone ran, someone with a bald head, shaved head, ran on the field, got a hold of the ball and kicked it through the goal and ran like this and then the police came and took him off. But the reaction of the fans was to sing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, just like joking at his bald head. So. <laughs> at that time, that, that was common. So it was that, that, that yes. I'm telling that anecdote because it's something laughable. It's like a joke. You have a bald head, it's, uh, shave your head like it's, it's a joke. Now I just, I was just asked one of my, one devotee, he's about to get initiated, and he's, he, he's asked if he could shave, not shave his head because he has to meet the dean of the university or this and that. I tell him, what's the problem? You go with a shaved head and he what's the problem in, in Britain in 2022? To, you can go to meet the dean with the shaved head and if he asks anything, say, yeah, I just got spiritual initiation. So what? So times have changed. I, I, my overall impression was that um, people saw it as unusual, not, not many people not very happy with it, but uh, not very distant. Anyway, 
just a handful of people anyway. It's not, it wasn't like a huge thing. But it was known, especially in London, because our devotees used to go chanting daily. And in the, you're going to get a lot of people, a lot of devotees telling you the same thing. But it was in the, uh, f for tourism, for visiting London, they, one of the things they showed, Big Ben, and I don't know, what, what else do they show? They didn't have the London Eye at that time, Big Ben, and I don't know what else they showed, but one of the pictures they showed was uh, devotees chanting, like a tourist really? attraction. Yeah, yeah, because it's something, something connected with London, people identify with London, that if you go to London, you can see these people chanting on Oxford Street. So it's a tourist. And, and there's still the police would arrest us. But on one hand, they, it was good for the economy, it seems. But on the other hand, yeah, the police have to have some fun. It's easy to arrest devotees. You've got to arrest someone. It's easier to arrest peaceful devotees than actual criminals. But they don't do that much now, do they? I don't think so. Not yes. in England, anyway. Yes. Mm. What was your first service when you moved into the temple? Uh, it was just uh, odd jobs, cleaning, that's all. And after that? After, after about ten days or two weeks, I was sent from, uh, from Bhaktivedanta Manu, where I joined, to Berry Place for book distribution. Actually, it wasn't book distribution, we were doing, we were selling, uh, I remember we were selling these 45 RPM vinyl records. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. You know, okay. Of uh, Hans Adutas, Kirtans, and, uh, or maybe it was the full, maybe it was the full LP, I don't really remember. What had happened, so I was told, was that Shama Sunda Prabhu had taken some mortgage on the manor for doing his ruby business and lost all the money. This is what I was told. So all the devotees, they were out selling records to pay off the, the debt. And they weren't, shortly after I joined, at the at Berry Place, the devotees they were so fed up with it, they wanted to distribute books. I remember a, the first ever Sankirtan meeting I went to. The devotee Hansadudu was there, and all the devotees were bitterly complaining. We don't want to do these records. We want to do books. But Hansadudu was the GBC at the time was pushing. No, we have to do the, the records, just to cover up the debt. And I remember Ananda Mai, one god brother, he said, no, no, British people won't take books, they're too demoniac. <laughs> that was a word we used a lot in those times. There were devotees and there were demons. It says right in Bhagavad Gita, right? So everyone else was a demon. Um, but anyway, shortly after that, we went on to books because devotees were just really, really, really fed up of distributing records. Gokul Ananda, you going to meet him? I hope so. He, uh, because what Hans Aduta gave everyone what they called a mantra for selling the, <laughs> the record. Uh, hello, we're monks and we went to India and we had a festival and we're selling this record to help George Harrison help produce it which was a lie, and uh, we were raising money for this or that. So he told me he met, a, he met a man on Charing Cross Road. Do you know Charing Cross Road? No, it's a major road just close to the temple on Soho. And it's close, close to Soho means it's close to Bury. If you come out of Bury Place and go up New Oxford Street, you come to the crossroads of Tottenham Court Road, Oxford Street, New Oxford Street, and Charing Cross Road. So it's right at the end of Oxford Street. If you're coming down and you, you take a right, you're on, you're on uh, 
Charing Cross Road, and the, the bookshop is their Foyles Bookshop, which they used to advertise as the biggest bookshop in the world, but I don't know if it is now. So that was a good place for distributing books. So Gokul Ananda told me that <laughs> he stopped a man and gave him the record, and the man told him the whole mantra. <laughs> the man, taught, he knew he said it right back to him. He'd been stopped so many times. So they were all fed up of that. And then we went on to book distribution. And we were distributing Krishna books, that, that three-volume trilogy, the same book that I'd been distributed to. And then after some time, Jayatirtha was appointed our GBC. That was 1976. Because I remember that I was in Mayapur at the festival. I was allowed to go to the festival because it was promised that the top two book distributors in Berry Place could go to the Mayapur festival, which was myself and Satyavak. Satyavak passed away quite a few years ago. So we were the top two, and then we went to India, and I got very sick. And I never really recovered from that sickness. Although It was hepatitis B, although apparently I didn't get it from India. I picked it up from Mahabuj, who just come back from Africa. But anyway, Vichy Javier, who was the town president, he was very upset that we lost, you know, and they lost a major book distributor and the income it was also needed. So anyway, I remember Jai Tithi made the GBC, and at that time in Mayapur, there was only, you can't even see it now because it's been merged into the main building of the temple, but there was only what is now called the Lotus Building. Um, and there was, the, on the wall, on the periphery, there were little huts made of, so we were staying in these huts. And I was very impressed the first, I never heard of Jayatith. I, I was just, I was hardly in the movement, and less than one year. And I was very impressed with Jayatith, who came in and he sat down on, on this, on the floor, on this, uh, in this little hut, and we called all the English devotees, and he spoke to us. And very, everyone was impressed with his humility and his gentle manliness, and uh, and he got things done. He brought Tulsi Das from Los Angeles, where he was based there. Others will tell you so much more about him. And he brought uh, Danavir. Prabhu at the time to get the Bhakta program going. So Tulsi, da, what, what Jayatirtha did, he, as far as I understand, he took more, he took, he made some more loan or something. And, uh, and immediately he, he's, because what happened, the movement was so poor at the time, that we would give Radha Gokula Ananda the, uh, the garlands, which are mostly leaves, rhododendron leaves from the garden with a few flowers here and there. And the, the morning Mongolati offering was just a tiny little bit of very small amount of milk sweets. And the, 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 there was plenty of milk and every morning would, because Indian visitors would bring uh, semolina and sugar. So every morning we had semolina, sugar, like a porridge and maybe this much Mahaprasad, because there wasn't much Mahaprasad to show. Everyone was standing in a long line, and that was the greatest sensual gratification of the day, was this much Mahaprasad at breakfast. And it was so cold, I went there on Easter day, and it was snowing, which is probably not expected so late in the year. It was cold. It was so cold that when the flame came around in the arti, that was a little bit of sense gratification also, to warm your hands a little bit. And there was no heating in the building. Everyone would walk around inside with coats and heavy. So it was very austere like that. Very warm clothing. So yeah, Jai Tirtha changed everything. He, uh, He, uh, he took money and then he said, he said, first of all, we have to serve the deities properly. Srila Prabhupada had written a letter to him previously when he was in Los Angeles. He said that 
you have good business sense and you worship the deities nicely and therefore I like you. And with his good business sense, he got, he got the manner, he improved the financial situation. And I believe, yeah, he, he made prasad better for everyone. He increased the, de the deity's clothing, everything. It is so nice. And um, prasad for the devotees was improved. He introduced... Danavir introduced that for his Bhakta program. Danavir was brought to make the Bhakta program. He introduced having apple, crumble and custard every evening before Arati. Oh, Janaki Mataji and Ram Sharon Prabhu mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, it was a big thing. It was like all of a sudden, wow, wonderful. Wow. <laughs> that was that was a big thing. And he took the loan, but then uh, he brought Tulsi Das Prabhu in, and Tulsi Das was able to get all the matajis out on, on on selling. And they were also they went to selling records. I, I can't remember if they did records, but that was considered something impossible. It had never been possible to do before to get to get the women out, and they they were big in collection in London. They used to wear these big hats and the police used to joke that they're, they're, they're from Hatfield because the, the women had hats, big hats to cover their heads. So they brought, they started bringing in lots of money and they, they were selling... Uh, they were selling flowers. I, I, don't say, I don't remember myself ever selling anything except books. Mataji is selling flowers, as I know. Oh, yeah, they gave flowers and asked for donations. That's right, yeah. Uh, but I think also I, others can tell you better. Amita can tell you. He was, the, uh, he was put in charge of the Sankirtan early on. He joined just before me. Um, so, yeah, they raised lots of money. And then the whole economic condition improved and everything, he, he brought, he just changed everything. He made it so much more confident, otherwise it was just a struggle. Another thing, I was the first one to join after, the first for, to join for about six months, which was a long time in those days. But when we started distributing books and, and, and more came others, and shortly after that Satyavak came, his brother had already joined before that, and others joined shortly after that. So, yeah, Jaitism made a lot of difference and everyone loved him and they loved his wife. And uh, I didn't see, I didn't see the, uh, the, the later part of Jaitirtha with his fall down and everything. I was already out of England, so others can tell you about that. But I really, really, I really, really wish he could have just remained as he was. It would have been very good for the movement. He was, he was so nice. Was, well, many of the leaders in those days, it was almost as if they were cultivating not being nice. They were, they, it was almost like a, um, a necessary part of being a sannyasi, is that you have to be nasty and heavy. <laughs> I, I'll tell you one anecdote. Um, one sannyasi came to Berry Place and he gave a talk and in the it was very, very heavy talk in which he said that, that women are all tigresses sucking your blood. No, no, I can't remember, but it was very heavy and it was about women and like this and that. And then one of the brahmacharis, I think it was Gokulananda, but I don't know for sure. He said that, well, aren't... He said, that, aren't we supposed to respect women as our mothers? And he said, no, you should see them all as tigresses coming to suck your blood. And I remember we, the brahmacharis in Berry Place, we weren't, we didn't feel very happy with that because we, we didn't talk about the women, but it was just, um, we very much respected the, the matajis that, uh, at very place for worshipping Radha Landanishwar, who was a life and soul. Patitu Daran Prabhu, he could tell you a lot. He's in Bulgaria, but I don't know how you can get a hold of him because he doesn't like to use 
Zoom or anything like that. But uh, I, I had a lot of association with him in Berkeley. I used to talk with him a lot. Whenever, I don't know how we had time to talk, but I did somehow or other. I used to massage his back because he'd been in a, uh, in a road accident prior to that, some years before. And I was the only one who would walk on his back, which he wanted. I was the only one who was young enough as a devotee to not know you're not supposed to walk on devotees' backs. So I'd do that, and he'd say so many things. To, he told me so many things. And one thing he said is, he asked me once, why is this temple, why is it so... Uh, I can't remember exactly the words he used. Why is it so vibrant and blissful? And I, I didn't know what to say. And he says, because of the temple president. And I believe at the time... No, I, yeah, when I was there in Berry Place, I, I don't remember any... Maybe when I joined, Prabhu Vishnu was the town president, but he's hardly ever there because he was all out, all over Britain, visiting different centers, going on traveling Sankirtan. And I, it's for, just when he joined, just when I joined in very place, or just just before that, or just after that, Vichy Javir became the town president. So I think Vichy Javir, I said, yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a very good town president. He said, no, it's Radha and Ishwara. Everyone loved them. So we all respected. We did, we all had very high regard for the for the team of Mataji's who were looking after the deities. So uh, we, I, in my experience, I, I didn't see that, that that we hear about women being mistreated and disrespected. But maybe they felt like that. I don't know. But I, I from from our side, we do, I. I I didn't feel any mood like that. Distance was there for sure, but we did. We did, I didn't feel any sense of disrespect. No such thing. We uh, we highly, especially the women at the uh, at Barry Place, we highly respected them from a distance. <laughs> Were there any bhakta program when you joined? No, there's no bhakta program. Bhakta program means you get out on the street. That's all. <laughs> May I ask you to describe Berry Place Temple at that time? Berry Place, you'll hear so much. It's, it's there's something magical about that temple. Mm. How many devotees there? Difficult to say because um, it's always changing. Uh, devotees come in and go. There might be devotees there and then they're sent away here and there. Or always there is float, there are floating devotees, devotees. Devotees would often, when they're coming from America to India or on the way back, they'd often stop in London. I, I think the, I don't think they, no, they didn't have direct flights in those days, so they'd often stop over in London. They're always coming and going. One major reason devotees would stop coming and going from America was uh, Radha London Ishwar's Prasadam was famous. And the, the head cook was uh, Kulangana. She was in Berry Place at the time, yeah. And she, she had heard of Prabhupada's rule, I don't know if it was a rule, that you have very simple prasadam six days a week and then a big feast on Sunday. So we had simple prasad, but with Radha Landanishra's Mahaprasad, the breakfast, it still it was enough to make it wonderful for everyone. And we had uh, fried chickpeas. Apparently Prabhupada said you have fried chickpeas, but no more than, I think it was 10 or something. So we'd count them out. <laughs> no more than 10. And then every Sunday a huge, huge feast, famous feasts. Devotees would come from the manor just for the feast. <laughs> it was better than the manor. I asked Richard Shavir that, that you see, Prabhupada gave us these feasts, but I, what would happen after the feast? Because the Brahmachari ashram is right at the top of the building. It's six stories. You have to walk up all these stairs every time. So if you if you left something in this temple room, you'd have to come all the way down and all the way up. And uh, and and then there was the loft, where that was also some sleeping space. So that was very cold, though. But. Um, there was hardly any room. The, the, the Brahmacharya ashram. 
probably half the size. This must be about maybe about ten feet by ten feet or something. Mm -hmm. Probably maximum fourteen. There was one, yeah. So I asked him, why does Prabhupada allow these feasts when we we just we all overeat and then then we just all sleep? The devotees have to completely stuffing themselves. And somehow or other, get up the stairs and just flop, <laughs> and then you'd find on the on the floor and in the shower room also because the devotees sleep in the shower room because there was nowhere to. It was crowded, very crowded. So you find devotees, oh. Oh, <laughs> groaning <laughs> from having eaten too much. I asked Richard, why did Prabhupada allow it? And he immediately replied, because if he didn't, we'd all bloop. <laughs> so the feasts, yeah, devotees would come, stopping it over from there. So it's difficult to say how many devotees were there because the, there was the, the fixed devotees were the, the Pujaris and not many others. The Pujaris were the Matajis and Yashoda Dulal should interview him also. He was the only male Pujari. I remember Leela Shakti would call up the stairs, Yashoda Dulal! And it was time for him to come and do his service. <laughs> he wasn't on time, she'd call up the stairs. Mm -hmm. and then she'd catch any Brahmachari who she found. Go and, go and wake him up and bring him. Hmm. So yeah, it's hard to say how many devotees Approximately were in how many were in, the, how many were in the manor. The best person to ask, I would think now, is Jai Lakshman because he was, the, or maybe Janananda. Jai Lakshman was the treasurer at one point, then Janananda. Mm -hmm. and then they made, they made me the treasurer at one point. I can't understand why. Because I was just a new kid with no experience. Um, but they might know because they might know. They, they were, I was a treasurer but I wasn't in management meetings. But they would have, so how many people you have to feed and all they they probably know how many. I, I would guess at the manor including the children when I joined there was about 50 mostly Grihastas. Maybe not that many. I, I really, it's hard to say. And again, coming and going, they're always coming and going. Mm. Yeah, then next. The next, uh, may I ask you to speak a little bit about the temple life in Bury Place in 1975? Bury Place specifically. 76. Oh. What activities well, do you have anything to place speci there? more specific? Uh, there are so many things that could be said. Mm. Uh, <coughs> very blissful, very crowded. Every at night, every inch of the floor was covered. Sometimes we'd see because the stairs going up, and then when it goes around the corner, it's it's uh, it's a little bit bigger. So some smaller body devotees were sleeping. I don't know how they did that. Oh right, it's uh, as you go up. There's a little square. Go up the stairs and it comes around like this, mm -hmm. and there's a little square patch. So some small bodied devotees could, men, would squeeze into that to sleep. Because was, a lot of the time it was so crowded. Uh, I suppose there was, there was one shower for all the men, mm -hmm. which means in the morning you were allowed about 10 seconds in the shower. You weren't allowed a hot shower. Only cold water was Only cold water, yeah. There was one Gujarati devotee. He was initiated by, he was studying medicine, Brajendra Nandan. And he would, he would scream every morning in the cold shower. <laughs> he would scream and protest, and try and put the hot shower on. And then there was one toilet also for all the brahmacharis, so. That could be troublesome when someone's bursting to let out their load. <laughs> so, yeah, very crowded, very blissful. The temple room, very crowded. 
Was it smaller than the Soho Temple room? Even right smaller, there? was it? Yes, I heard that. Even smaller. And Radha and Ishra are so close, and they were just on this level, so you could you feel you could shake your hand with them. <laughs> Jagannath was above. Yes. You've seen the pictures. So it made a very intimate relationship with Radha and Ishra. It's so close to them. There was hardly any space for the pujari to even stand <coughs> to offer anything. <coughs> <laughs> So that was it. We were young, we were enthusiastic, we were idealistic, we were passionate in the in a lot of energy. And uh, yeah, we were happy. So many things I could say. I assume most of the devotees were book distributors at that time. Yeah, that was the main service, and, and there wasn't much going on apart from that. One summer, that must have been the summer of 19... Oh, I don't know whether it was 76 or 70, 77. Prabhavishnu, Brahmacharya at the time, so he made a program because there's so many people going past to go to the British Museum. So he'd have a devotee standing outside inviting people to come in. And then there, would, uh, there was the temple room on the ground floor, prasadam room and the kitchen in the basement. You know all that. And the first floor, Prabhupada's room, but we didn't keep it like in the manor because of shortage of space. So we utilized that room when Prabhupada wasn't there. And that was just, that was called the guest room. And what we'd do is, um, we'd, we'd invite people to come in, and then when there were about 30 people, they'd bring them into the room, and they'd have a session with them for about 20 minutes, and just preach to them. Prabhupada Vishnu, he did it mostly, as far as I know, at least he started it. And, um, Preach them, get them to chant a round of japa. This was just, they were tourists from all over the world. And they'd chant japa, give them some prasadam, and then bring in the next batch of people. It was a great program, mm -hmm. because you'd do it all day throughout mm -hmm. the summer for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, mostly devotees were going out on book distribution. That, that was the main thing. And as you will learn from others previously, it was they just. Yeah, their only program was going out on Harinam Sankirtan. They take, they have the morning program, take breakfast, go out on Harinam up New Oxford Street, cross onto Oxford Street, go all the way up to Marble Lodge, come back the other side, and then that would bring them back for lunch. They take lunch and then they'd go out again, up, down, and that would bring them back in time to take a shower and go for the evening arti and the evening program. And then they'd take rest. And that was all day, every day, six days a week. And then on Sunday they'd have the feast. Mm. <laughs> and so hours and hours and hours of chanting. And then later it became uh, book distribution. Mm -hmm. So you distributed books next to the Harinam party? No, uh, when, I was, when I joined, the, the Harinam was much decreased. We mostly did only book distribution. Mm. And there was the Saturday night Hainam, and then on special festivals we'd do Hainam. I remember once we had Balaram Purnima, and we, we had a big feast, and then we went out on book distribution, and as soon as we got outside the door, there was a black, Mar what do they call that, black Mariah, to, to pick, to arrest us all. It was waiting right there. You know what that is? It's a black policeman, oh. and they just threw everyone in. We hadn't even gone on, we hadn't even, we'd just come out of the temple. They started throwing everyone in, arresting them all. Or maybe I'm getting mixed up, there was some, but I'm, uh, there was one feast, uh, Balaram appearance day, and then we went out for Harinam after that. So we didn't do Harinam that much. Saturday night, and then the, the book distribution. I was at very place distributing books, and then uh, some of the time, and some of the time from the manor, because there mm -hmm. were shuffling devotees around. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, 
it wasn't so much at that time that Berry Place was administratively a separate entity from the manor. It was, I, I believe Prabhavishnu was overseeing the whole of England and we just moved devotees around. So sometimes I was doing book distribution out of the manor, which means going out in vans, for transit vans, and sometimes at Soho Street, and um, no, it's very place. One summer I was all summer with Adi Carter, just the two of us on Oxford Street. <laughs> we were selling Gita's, the abridged mm -hmm. Gita's. Only the two of us were doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, but other times we've been so the, the, the traveling parties would mostly go out for six days, and then they'd come back from the manor. Sometimes they'd go out for two weeks, but mostly they'd go out for six days, come back and meet at uh, in central London, have a big high nam with all the book distributors mm -hmm. who'd just been on book distribution all week. And then they would, uh, then they'd go back to the manor, and by Sunday they'd by Sunday they'd have a feast, mm -hmm. and they'd restack the books, and we'd have a sankirtan meeting. And often the parties were reshuffled because all the devotees couldn't get on with each other, and they'd reshuffle the parties around. And then by Sunday night they'd be out again, going to wherever they were going. An advantage of Britain being a small country is. It's never more than, it's usually no more than three or four hours drive wherever you're going. I guess Hungary is the same. Yes. <laughs> Can you recall how many vans or how many groups? Oh, exactly, I don't know. Amita would know. He was the Sankirtan leader. Mm -hmm. There were quite a few. And we'd have three or, f three, four or five men. One time, we went out for a long time. We went to Ireland. We went out for about two months. We were there. They put all the best book distributors out because Ireland is the best place for distributing in the whole of the British Isles. It probably still is. Really? Yeah, the people are different. I don't know what it's like now because everything's changed and Ireland's become much more modern and commercial. But uh, the, the people are much more open. Northern Ireland people are different to Republic of Ireland people, and both were very good for book distribution. So they sent the best book distributors there. So there was myself, Amita, Vangshi Vadana, um, Tiaga Tony, who became Navanita Chora, who eventually cut Jayatirtha's head off, and I believe Dharani Dara was with us. He wasn't a good book distributor, but so much, but he was. banking the money and doing the shopping and this and that. He also did some books. So I could talk about a lot about Ireland in those days also. Major problem in Ireland, people were ready to give money, but they didn't have any money. Many times they say, I don't have any money, and then they'd open their purse and they'd say, they don't have any money. And Northern Ireland people had money. And they're mostly, uh, they're either Protestants or Catholics. And there was fighting going on. But still, they're very generous and took books. We sold a lot of books. So that was good. Distributing books in Northern Ireland. With <laughs> One time we came at night, we came in from somewhere to Belfast. Belfast is surrounded by hills. So we came in and we saw the whole city with the lights on. And we went into the city and everything was closed down. And after six o'clock, no one moves around because there's bombings and shootings and all this kind of thing. So we, we looked around and we thought, we'll say, where are we going to do book distribution tomorrow? So we went to Woolworths. We saw, well, did they serve Woolworths? No. Finished, huh? that was a symbol yeah, of Britain. Woolworths, they said, okay, we'll come here tomorrow and do book distribution. We came the next morning, there was no more Woolworths. There was just some smoke. <laughs> it had been bombed in the night. <laughs> so that was the situation there. The soldiers everywhere. They used to wake us up in the night. We'd sleep in the van. And we'd go out of the city into the field 
so they wouldn't find us, but still, some, often they'd find us, the village people report. If we stayed in the towns, then the police would wake us up, or the army. And the, or if it's at night, the army boys would wake us up. And we just tell them what we're doing, and they were usually very appreciative of what we were doing. Didn't They're the same age as us, you know, young, young, young men. So they, I guess they appreciated we're austere, dedicated, like they are, doing something good. Hmm. Well, that's you, another story, Ireland. Hmm. Did you involved in deity worship at that time? Uh, I, not much, but... Um, there was a privilege. If, if you were doing book distribution, you could, you could offer the Mongol Arti. If you're doing well, you, when you come on Sunday, you could ask to offer the Mongol Arti. And uh, what happened due to our naive way of living in the cold, we, did, we were living in cold vans and uh, unheated vans and taking baths with freezing cold water, and then on the street, freezing cold all day, so I got very sick. And then, uh, that's why I went to India, for the warm climate. And uh, so I, I was in, I came to Berry Place, because I couldn't go out on book distribution anymore, because of my health condition. So at that time, yeah, I, I would offer Mongolati every morning, and then I would cook for the deities and the uh, and the devotees, breakfast. And then I would be helping with that preaching program that Prabhupada That must have been, I, I think that must have been 77, because shortly after that I left for India. Yeah. So yeah, I, 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 puja exactly I didn't do. Puja and dressing, but arti I often like to, I, I still like to, but I stopped because of the physical problems, same bodily pain. Otherwise, I always, always like to offer arati wherever I was. But intimately involved in deity worship, no. Not in the sense of going on the altar, bathing the deities. Hardly I did that. Do you remember what you used to cook? <laughs> what I used to cook? We had something that we, we always wanted to, we'd see what the others were cooking and we tried to make different things. We wouldn't want to do the same thing on the same sabji or the same pakoras on the same day. And we, we tried to make vary the menu. But it was a standard, it would be, depending on the time of day, it would be two sabjis and one savory and this, the, this, the sweets were made uh, either the night before or very early in the morning and they'd be given throughout the day and they're probably doing the same thing now and you make some extra sweet like that. So it was a standard thing and the um, pakoras were the standard savory and sometimes if, if those who knew what they were doing could make samosas or kachoris and like that. Sabjis, yeah. I used to cook what we called Maha Brinjo. I used to cook that a lot. <laughs> so many subjects. What was the separate uh, breakfast for devotees? For devotees? Uh, Indian things or oatmeal? Or? Uh, well, I used to cook in those. There was upama was quite often. I think we had it every day, actually. Almost every day. But then there'd be others, like I say, the Mahaprasad, there was so much Mahaprasad from, from the... Oh, and that time, yeah, that very place... No, that, that... I'm getting, it's all mixed up in my mind, but I was... Yeah, the time I was staying in Berry Place, due to my health issues, was the time when Berry Place was running on absolutely minimum staff because the the council had stopped us having more people living there 
so yeah oh that was that was a different time I, now I'm getting mixed things are getting mixed up in my mind but um, 76 maybe it's so yeah 77. we had so much Mahaprasad and very few devotees because the, the local council would they, they were enforcing the <laughs> the rules which we never followed before it wasn't meant it wasn't even meant for residents that building it wasn't wasn't supposed to be for residents. So, and then we had to get Soho. We had to get another building because very place was, but for we couldn't operate there as a temple on the on the level we wanted to. So yeah, during that time I was, yeah, I was cooking. It was another time I, I, I it's all mixed up in my mind. So at that time we had so much Mahaprasad and devotees were all getting sick and they were just, oh, I just want some simple prasadam. Because <laughs> every day they'd have puris and sweet rice and sabjis full of ghee and oh. <laughs> overload. Did you make chapatis? Because I, I know that chapatis oh, yes. is a big thing. When, when I joined in the manor, we didn't have any. The, 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 the suji, what do you call that? Semolina with, uh, it's called farina in American English. Semolina. So, yeah, that was the breakfast with, with sugar and milk. But, but apart from that, the, the, the lunch, all Indian chapatis. Kula Shekhar came once. He came in and stayed for some time, the, the first British devotee. So he came for some time and he said, what, what, what is this chapati? You know how to cook chapati. So he started cooking chapatis and they were first class. And then it, no one, before no one was hardly eating chapatis because they were just like rubber tires or something. Then he started cooking and he showed us how to cook and they were first class and everyone was eating six or seven chapatis. That's what we. That's why that that uh, apple crumble with custard was introduced in the evening, and devotees all went. They went wild over it because we didn't have any Western food. It was all Indian food. In the manor and in Soho Street, there was nothing. I don't think the word pizza was even heard of. It, it wasn't even popular in England at the time. So. Uh, Pizza, bread, cake, all this. No, never. It was all Indian food, in my memory. Maybe others remember. You could ask Partha. He did a lot of cooking also. Mm. He was a good cook. He took it upon himself to cook the, uh, the Sunday feast at the manor every time. Mm. And he really brought the standard up. Um, I remember also so many, so many devotees were getting boils. And uh, one Indian homeopathic doctor came. His homeopathy is not very popular in England, probably. I don't know if it is now, but it was not hardly heard of. So he, he was, they asked, I, th I believe Pater, you can ask him. He brought the, this in to see why, why so many boys getting boils. And he, he went, he found, he looked in the kitchen, saw all aluminium pots. He said, get rid of all of these pots, mm -hmm. these aluminium pots. So he did at a huge expense, considering that the manor didn't have money hardly at the time, and he changed it all to steel pots. It's interesting to me that uh, you said that everyone wanted to make various recipes, various well, it was it was practically a rule, and I believe especially at Berry Place or, or everywhere. It's a, the, the, at least I heard that, that you should try to make, don't make the same preparations. I, I mean, of course, rice, puris, you'd cook the same every day. Did you have but, recipes but sabjis, at time? recipes, we had the Hare Krishna cookbook by Kirtan Ananda. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we learned the traditional system. You get, you get shown. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know who first showed me, but my most influential cooking gurus were, um, I can't remember who I learned from first, Maha Karta from Sri Lanka was there for some time, and uh, Sadananda. 
from New York. His father and grandfather were professional cooks and he'd been in Mayapur for some time cooking. So he was very good at mass cooking. And so they, were, they both taught me a lot and I did cooking for years. But then when I took sannyasa, I decided not to cook anymore. I thought, let me, let me uh, do other things. I have to do writing, it takes a lot of time. So I've hardly cooked since I took sannyas. Mm -hmm. Rarely. Otherwise, almost since I, almost since I joined, well, Brahminical initiation, I got 10 or 11 months after joining the temple, and then I was, I was cooking everywhere, wherever I want, somehow or other. I learned Bengali style, and everything. Um, even on traveling Sankirtan, I introduced cooking. There was another heresy <laughs> to cook on traveling Sankirtan, but I made it simple. Uh, was uh, there two Devi at the time? Hmm? At, was was there uh, at the time two Devi at Bury Place worshipped? Oh yes, that was from the very beginning. Except in the beginning they were worshipping Basil, <laughs> but that, but uh, I wasn't there. But that was before. Yeah, Tulsi was there. I can't remember where she was, where she was kept. That they, I think the Matajis were doing that. But we didn't see. Mm -hmm. We just saw Tulsi came out at uh, Tulsi Arati. Mm -hmm. But exactly, you'd have to ask the Matajis. You must have their names. Lila Shakti, then Krishna Vesha, I think she's in England. I don't know. Then uh, Jalastita, I think she's in America. Who else was there? I, I can I don't remember now. Jagat Mohini. Jagat Mohini, maybe, I don't know. I don't remember that name when I was there. Mm. I don't know. Krishna Vesha a few years ago was teaching at the manor when they had a guru called Arasan. I don't know, you can ask. Mm -hmm. Yes, I Find can out ask. if she's here. You can can I ask you about where the. She joined when she was 14, I think. Mm -hmm. Were there any challenges for you in the temple life and joining Krishna consciousness? Oh, I don't remember particularly challenges. I just remember it was all bliss. No, I, I don't... No, I, I can't think of anything actually. What, what might you suggest? Sometimes devotees may be, may be mentioned, the cold water, baths or yeah, but wait a minute. Getting mind. up early. Getting up early, yeah. <laughs> That's what like you that. do when you're a Hare Krishna devotee. You, you get up early and take a cold bath. So if you're yeah. going to do it, you do it. That's all. You mentioned there were no heating in the manor at that time. Or yeah, something but like that. that's the way it was. And that's, that's just what you did. Some devotees found it difficult to get up early in the morning. I remember Ratna Nab sometimes got thrown down the stairs in his sleeping bag. Because yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't get up by the temple commander who is now an ISKCON GBC and guru. I won't tell you his name. <laughs> another, one, <laughs> another one was regularly dragged in the manor along the floor in his sleeping bag <laughs> and thrown in the shower in his sleeping bag, but he's, he wouldn't get out. <laughs> But most of the devotees didn't find it a challenge. Somebody mentioned that devotees can fall asleep at any time during oh, the yeah. lecture, during yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. car, or anywhere. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I, I remember once I fell asleep three times in Guru Puja, standing up. Because <laughs> <laughs> Dhanavir was the head of the Bhakti program, I was assisting him for some time. And he said, You're not allowed to take rest in the day. 
But I would, at night I would have to uh, be last to take rest and first to rise for the bhaktas. And after about a month of that, Raghubir, who is now Bhakti Chaitanya Swami, woke me up three times as I was about to fall off <laughs> in the Guru Puja. <laughs> but I didn't think of it as a challenge. It was just, that's what we did. That's our life. That's what we do. I, I mean, I didn't think this is something horrible or anything like that. Challenge, maybe. I don't think we talk about things like people have become more, more uh, narcissistic and psychology oriented, and always worrying about things that are going wrong. But we, I think the culture was different in those days. You know, things are tough. Well, life's tough. Just get on with it. That's all. Hmm. I heard that the, the connections and the relationships with, uh, between the devotees, amongst the devotees, was different. Like yeah, it was the, very tight. We were very tight and close. It's, it's, I guess it's like being in an army at war. So that spirit was there. And like I said, on the traveling parties, the, uh, the, the, there was tension also, so the parties were regularly reshuffled. But basically we were all together. So, are, are you happy sitting here listening, or are you going to rush off? Yeah, 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 very happy. Because I don't know how long this is going to go on, this talk. As <laughs> she's going to go on as long as she wants, but I have to cut out at some point. Yeah. I'm enjoying it also, talking oh. all these things. <laughs> Probably you'll take, if you take anything from this interview, it'll be, it'll take up about maybe one line of your PhD, because that's what research is like, as you know. And making, uh, you, you, and you go through lots and lots of stuff and you take out what you want, which might be just very little or nothing at all. And looking for general patterns general and patterns, features yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. okay, then what else? Um, I know, I do uh, research also. Somebody Mostly mentioned... Mostly reading. <laughs> but you go through a whole book and you might take nothing out of it or one line out of it or something. Mm. Somebody mentioned the hierarchy, hierarchy between the devotees was very strict and devotees respect each other. Maybe uh, the... Time. I don't know what it's like now, so I can't compare it. Uh, not have to compare, just about... Well, I can't say whether it's very hierarchical or anything, because I don't know what it is like now. I mean, devotees respect somebody get initiation two months earlier than me, or he's another devotee than me. I don't remember that so much. Mm -hmm. I remember when I joined that devotee... Someone who had been in the movement three or four years was a senior devotee. Mm -hmm. um, it was, yeah, very high respect for sannyasis. Uh, GBC, the two GBCs I saw were uh, Hans Dutta, who was, you know, definitely looked up to very much, but uh, he was personable and approachable also. It wasn't like he was on a big high pedestal or any such thing. And uh, Jaitith was very much respected. But he's also very, uh, very personable. Maybe not so approachable because the movement expanded. So, and he was traveling around. Anyway, these are just subjective opinions. But I didn't find a rigid hierarchy. There was definitely a hierarchy, but it wasn't... Uh, It was a natural kind of thing. It wasn't enforced in our minds. It was it, there was natural respect, but I I don't even remember anyone saying you should respect senior devotees. It was just there, and you did mm. it. You just picked it up because it was like that. And all of us, the, the, all of the brahmacharya, we all had very high respect for Leela Shakti, especially because she was looking after the deities. Mm. She was really. A, really on top of it. Mm. 
And although devotees respect each other, uh, the mood was very familiar because everybody... Yeah, when I mean, you're living so closely yes. packed up like that, it has to be familiar. <laughs> there is no privacy. Mm. <laughs> the only time you'd be alone is when you're passing stores. <laughs> <laughs> That could be challenging as well for some, some people. Yeah, maybe for some. But like I say, we, 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 didn't, we, we didn't regret it or any such thing. Um, but not many could maintain that throughout their life. So it was just a phase for, for most of us. You were a book distributor mainly at that time. Um, well, come to think of it, I did spend time as the accountant in the manor, and I was in Barry Place doing that, helping with that guest program. So, yeah, but I think most of the time I was distributing books. Uh, did you experience verbal or physical aggression during Sankirtan? Or yeah, did all you the have time. Stories but, uh, about that? Yeah, it's yeah. common. Mm -hmm. Physical, not so much. No, I, I don't remember anyone. Threats, yes, but physical, no. Verbal abuse, yeah. As you, I can imagine, even today, if you if you uh, go out and you try and stop people in city streets in England, people will tell you to F off and all this kind of thing. How many but that, but you see, we don't really see that as abuse because we're raised in this lecture culture and it's just part of life, that's all, mm -hmm. for us. We were doing the same thing to others just a short time mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't really... And this word abuse also, you didn't hear it. Is, um, and so Britain's become new agey. Otherwise, words like abuse and relationships. And we didn't hear those terms. What was that other one? That was some Aggression. Other yeah, that word was there. That was very much part of the culture. Agro, the skinheads called it. That was very much part of the youth culture. I wasn't involved in that, but it's all around you. It's a macho kind of culture in Britain. I guess that's a hangover from the empire days. And they, st they still are in some kind of illusion that they're in some big important country. So. Mm. How many times were you arrested? Because mentioned... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> few times. Were there any consequences of that? Yeah. You go to court, it's just a waste of time. But getting arrested and then the next day you have to go to court and pay a five pound fine. It's a routine. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen to me very often actually. But often they'd just arrest you and then or just detain you and let you go also. Actually, not that much, but uh, very often the police would move us on like that. Sometimes we'd have to leave a town. Mm. Uh, the next but we, I, I, we became quite good at avoiding the police. Oh. <laughs> There's one thing you learned. Did you ever do this for Sankirtan? No. No. Never. Western clothes. Never, never. Oh, actually, maybe once I went out I, I'm with Shubag, who was not a Swami at the time, who was living at Barry Place. We went out somewhere in London distributing. And as far as I remember, he was in a doti. But I'm not sure. I, maybe I was too. Otherwise, no, it was, it was, no. Just for Harinam, I think. For Harinam, yeah. 
And what about Prabha Vishnu Swami, who, who did this program to invite visitors to the Burry Place uh -huh. Temple? Did, uh, did he wear dhoti? Oh, yeah, inside the temple, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Inside the temple, we wouldn't wear kami clothes unless we were just going out for book distribution or just coming back. Because he invited people on the street. Yeah, and we'd have someone on the street in devotee clothes inviting people in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many people came, mostly foreign tourists. Mm -hmm. And the next topic is your connection, relationship with Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. When you first met with him. Uh, I wrote about that in my book called My Memories of Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. You can read it in okay. there. Was the first meeting uh, Meeting? Important. I didn't really meet with him. Okay. Ex 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 Gayatri Mantra, that's the only time I was alone with Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. But it's, all, it's there in my book, My Memories mm -hmm. of Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. You can see that. Uh, did your image meet the real spiritual relationship with Srila Prabhupada? I don't know. That's, all these, are, these questions are too psychological for me <laughs> about abuse and hierarchy and all this. I don't know. We, we, we. I didn't find any difference between what I was told and what I saw. Mm -hmm. My opinion or whatever you want to call it, or Srila Prabhupada, didn't change significantly upon f physically seeing him. Mm. Mm. Um, we know that you left England in 1977 for India. Yeah. I actually first left in 76 to go to India, but that was just for the Mayapur festival. Mm -hmm. And for some reason I spent extra time, I can't remember exactly why. Maybe because I was so sick, I spent a few extra weeks in, uh, because I, I don't know if I was well enough to travel or whatever. So I spent a few extra weeks in Vrindavan, and then I came back. But then I went in 77 with the intention of staying, mm -hmm. which I did. But what's the cause of it? What, hmm? what was the cause the of cause it? The cause because I needed a warmer climate. I, I didn't want to, I, I wasn't happy just being in the temple all day. Even though I had full-time service, I wanted to go out and distribute books. So I need a warmer climate. And that was the... I could have gone to South Africa or somewhere else, but I decided to go to India. Because there's a lot of book distribution going on there. Especially I heard about the BBT Library Party doing so many books. I wanted to join that. But by the time I got there, it was just winding up its activities. But then I went on and distributed books, not with the BBT Library Party. So that was the main reason I needed a, a warm climate. Mm. Was mm. it easy to get a passport or visa to India? At that I didn't time? need a visa at the time, just a passport. Oh. That's all. Just for Americans. No, British, British passport. I'm British mm -hmm. citizen. I already had a passport that was made for going to India in 1976. Mm -hmm. So I just went. You didn't need to register. You could just stay as long as you like. Mm -hmm. As there's no issue, no issues there at all. Mm -hmm. so just for Oh, that was another reason I went to India because yeah, we heard that Prabhupada wanted Commonwealth citizens to go because mm -hmm. they had no problem staying there. Yes, I see. Okay. Uh, Generally, at that time, it was thought that anyone who goes to India, they're all, only useless devotees go to India. Mm -hmm. That's what was thought. <laughs> Maybe because Srila Prabhupada had asked for so many Western devotees to be sent, and most of the town presidents sent all their difficult cases and all this and that. So it's generally considered that only India is for useless devotees. It was prestige <laughs> to step down <laughs> to be in India. You only go to India if you're useless. I guess I, I guess I fit that category. <laughs> then, other? Uh, the last question, I think, because the time is okay. so late. Okay, good. Uh, 
uh, what was your family and friends' opinion when you joined and became a Hare Krishna? Uh, I was already out of my family. I just left home at the age of 17. Uh, and there wasn't really much of a family. It was a bit of a mess. Uh, then I just told my father I'm joining the Hare Krishna movement, that's all. And my mother was already in a mental hospital, locked away there. And uh, yeah, he said that, well, I wanted you to be a lawyer, but if you're happy, I'm happy. That was it. Friends, I told one or two from my school days. Oh, them up. Can't remember much. Mm. It wasn't going to change my decision anyway. Yes. Thank you very much. It wasn't a big. It wasn't a big thing socially for me to to join. Mm. As well. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for your time and kindness. <laughs> You're very generous to me. Well, like I say, when I'm when I'm on tour, then I I'm not running away trying to write my books. It's put on hold, so I'm free. <coughs> I'm your property. <laughs> Thank you, you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. From Russia with love. <laughs> Made in Russia by the Vodians. I also have a little symbolic thing for you to express my gratitude for this opportunity. Just one moment. <laughs> I stopped this recording. Could you please call Rishikesh, tell him our session is finished? Oh. From from oh. Budapest. Very nice, thank you very much. It's made uh. from uh, Krishna Valley Cows. Right, yeah. Milk. And my Guru Maharaj made this book. It's a book oh. for meditation. <laughs> He, he, uh, he collected some prayers, huh? Yes, and uh, translated it. 